fuck up in one? Second one. Yeah. Did you still, because you can still see screens and stuff. That's pretty much clear. Okay, right, so is this mic on? Can everyone hear me okay? Cool. Yes. Yeah. Hello, Drupal Camp London. <laughs> Welcome to the business of community. My name is Steve Perkis, and I'm going to take things back to basics. Well, <laughs> basic, as in basic on BBC computer, which was the first computer I had way back in 1981. When I had hair, I used to look like this. <laughs> I used to live in the middle of nowhere in an old house with nothing much to do. So I used to play around with code. This was my very first program, not even the Hello World, just Hello, which when I pressed around would fill up the screen. <laughs> and then I learned if I put an extra space into the string and I pressed run on that one, it would go directly across the screen. And that's pretty much what I do these days with Drupal work out what does what, mix it all together. And every month I learned how to code more, and although I didn't understand a lot of the code, I had learned how to hack it to make it do what I want, and it was great. But I was a bit accident prone when I was a kid, and I got hit by a car and suffered brain bruising. Then a couple of years later, I got hit by another car, broke my leg. So fast forward to 1991, and my first job, the local computer store, EDR, where we used to sell these computers, which weren't quite computers, but glorified work posters, until the PC came out. And then Amstrad brought out theirs, and loads of people bought them. And we even sold these things, which are Tanzan 386 DX33s with 30 megabyte removable hard drives for three and a half grand. And Windows 3 came out and lots more people started to buy computers as it was easy to use with a mouse. But I'd always wanted to program, so I ended up on a government funded course where I learned RPG programming for the IBM AS400. Not role playing games, unfortunately, but a report program generator, relational database programming in a language which came originally from punch cards. I ended up doing work experience in Jerome's Mill in Shipley, Yorkshire, some satanic old mill, and did RPG for only about a year, ending up in a company called JBA who produced a massive ERP system. But this wasn't the kind of programming I wanted to do, and as I was seeing all my mates go to uni and have some fun, so I decided to go as a mature student. In fact, I ended up going to two unis, before ending up back in Essex, where there weren't many places to network and find business. But through an online business forum, Beyond Bricks, funded by the DTI, I picked up with a guy who had a company in London, IMM Studios. It was the dot-com days, and we had a modular J3 web app framework called, we called Remote Apps, which we had modules for the three C's of the internet, content management, commerce, and collaboration, and a web interface called TeamView, where you could create your own content types. A bit like something else I know, except Remote Apps were proprietary. I got to work on some great projects, like BQ's first DIY.com, but we also had the talent issue. I was the sixth person to join, and in two years we'd grown to 60 people, and we simply couldn't afford to keep employing the amount of people it took to build this thing. Then, in 2001, the dot bomb came. The funders pulled out, we went back to zero, and I was made redundant. Something I thought only happened to miners. I was quite lucky, though, and a friend from work had put me in contact with someone who wanted a website built, so I did the usual roll my own CMS. I didn't know at that time this guy called Dries had released something called Drupal. My first encounter with Drupal wasn't actually long after that though, as the business forum I belonged to was bought from the DTI by eCademy, which I believe was an old Drupal 4.7 site at the time. I discovered open source CMSs and went through the nukes and ended up with one called Zoops, which I got on well with. I was amazed by all this free software that I could use for my business, but people didn't seem to know much about it because free software didn't have a marketing department. I set up a site called the Plain English Guide to Open Source and wrote lots of articles, had supplier directories, etc. But still, the only work I managed to get was building websites for people. I kept networking and ran an open source group on the academy, and the testimonials kept coming, so I built more websites and learned business the hard way, asking for budget ranges up front so you don't end up building something where the client only wants to pay £500. So I kept networking, and the testimonials kept coming in. And I kept building more websites, and the testimonials kept coming. But then, I had a vision. Co-working spaces had just started springing up, and I thought these were the perfect places for providing support for free software. I mean, it's not like you're ever going to go down to your local PC world and they'll sit you down on a beanbag and ask how they can help you. IT should be about conversation, not just vlogging boxes of out-of-date, made-to-fit everyone's software. So, I wrote a blueprint, and it all seemed so logical to me. I didn't understand why people weren't throwing money at me. Through Academy, I had a mentor who said I was too stressed and needed to chill out. He was doing a talk in Toronto that weekend, so I decided where better to chill out than above the clouds, and ended up booking a flight for the next day. I was liking Toronto, and the more positive attitude people have out there when it comes to business. The UK is often quite negative if you're trying to do something. So, I decided to stay for a while and see if I could find funding for my concept out there. Meanwhile, the 
testimonials kept coming in and my confidence was building, especially after talking in person with industry luminaries about my concepts and getting their great feedback, but still no one was throwing money at me. I ended up staying much longer than I expected in Canada though, because I met a girl there who I didn't know hadn't been, hadn't been on meds for three years. That's a whole other story though, but it's when I next encountered Drupal. I've never wanted to use Drupal as I thought so much the same as people do today, that it's just too complicated. But one of my sites had been rebuilt in Drupal and that really pissed me off, so I finally looked under the hood of Drupal and was immediately hooked. This was great. And everything I could do previously for £80,000 of license, I could do it for free and I didn't have to write my own code, as it was pretty much all there. At the time though, because of my personal situation, I couldn't be seen to be interacting with anyone online, so I just used to download modules and read the code. I didn't really realise that there was this whole community thing going on. At about the same time, Dries had set up the Drupal Association to organise conferences, scale infrastructure, etc which even though now it's changed to a US educational non-profit, is pretty much most of what it does, along with things like giving cultivation grants and sorting scholarships. Dries already had big dreams, knowing that Drupal was always the answer. I was still trying to work out this community thing and submitted my first module, but didn't get reply. Well, not until recently anyway. At that time, I was back in the UK where I decided bankruptcy was the only way forward after escaping my bad relationship I was just in no fit state to deal with a lot of it. But I had Drupal and my own community of people who wanted to know more about it, so I did things like these when this 12 second website came out. My Drupal module recommendation now is for Poor Man's Plum. If you don't have it on the server you want to put development, uh, it will run Plum for you whenever you get to their site. Want to be top of Google? You need the Palm Auto and Token modules. And don't forget to enable those clean URLs. Oh yes, SEO will give you that. <laughs> want to do some social networking on the Drupal site? You need buddy list and private message. There are a couple of good ones to get you started. Oh yeah, social networking. Using Drupal 5. Download the update status module and find out when your modules have been updated. Oh yes, always should be kept current. Mm -hmm. If you want to view your data differently, download the view module. Display the latest five blog posts, perhaps. Or all the ones for this. Oh yeah, views, that's what you need. Your data's not the same as everyone else's data. You're going to want to save them like specific information to get the content construction kit is your bank holiday special oh yeah and it wasn't long before my Drupal abilities managed to bring me some work for Mazda which paid for me to move to Brighton which is where I live now everywhere I looked I still saw potential spaces for my vision one day one day I moved into Hove and had a lovely sea view if you ignored the billboards car park etc I've never lived by the sea before and it was very therapeutic considering what I've just been through. But admittedly, I didn't get much work done and I was enjoying Brighton. And we even managed to open up a co-working space on the beach for a short time. Enough time to have a party anyway. I saw other spaces with opportunities but also issues. Eventually a co-working space called The Skiff opened up in an office where Second Life had just moved out of. I joined in the fun and even got people I've met through Academy like Mike Southern to come down and give a talk. Through a recommendation, I won a project to rebuild holymoly.com from Java to Drupal. It was the first project I've done since becoming freelance, where I put a team together to deliver. The guy I worked with on Holy Moly eventually gave me his old projects when he moved up to London afterwards, one of which was the charity site Books for Keeps. It was a great site, but I quoted way too low for it and ended up spending months cleaning the data, so much so that I ended up not being able to form my lovely sea view and moved into a small bedsit. But I believe the site needs to be online. The information is amazing and it still is. And I had friends to keep me happy. Then I went to an event called Connecting Innovation, which is where I first encountered Ken Thompson and Virtual Enterprise Networks. I'm going to play you the video as it outlines the whole concept. Apologies for the bad sound, but it's the best copy I could find. We are told today that uh, we have to collaborate. And, and we know if we don't collaborate, we're going to be bottom feeders in the economy only getting work we can do ourselves. But I think my experience and a lot of people's experience is collaboration doesn't really work. It's too hard. And that's many people's experience. So uh, just a quick show of hands. If you've had a bad experience collaborating, put your hand up. Right, OK. 
Okay, that's quite a lot. Most collaboration fails because of lack of a systematic method. And I've worked in the collaboration space uh, for the last 10 years, and I've, all this, I've made all the mistakes you could possibly make. And I've written down what I think works, and, and it's in my new book called The, the Network Enterprise, which is basically how small businesses collaborate, and how business collaborates with academia, and even more difficultly, how businesses collaborate with regional investment bodies. Um, so I'm going to share some of those secrets with you very, very quickly tonight. To be able to compete as a network, you must first be able to collaborate. But most people don't trust each other. The reality is you don't need a high trust culture to collaborate. You just need to be able to trust the process. So there's a phrase called virtual enterprise network. Virtual Enterprise Network, I, I've used it extensively, I didn't invent it. I also use the phrase Network Enterprise. And uh, if, if you're an SME, the, the Virtual Enterprise concept is vital for you. The Virtual Enterprise concept is a way to achieve scale, to operate as if you had more resources than you actually have. It enables you to operate like a big player, but not slow. So networks are the best way for most small businesses to participate in the global economy. To be a really good business, you need to reach large customers. But large customers don't want to work with small businesses. The mantra of supply chain <coughs> rationalization eliminates that. So if you want to work with big customers, you cannot go it alone. You must learn to collaborate. Now, people aren't, uh, companies aren't doing this just because they like collaborating. There's a very good business model for collaboration. And when you work through the numbers in terms of the sales you can make, and this is based on real, real research from Switzerland, one small, well-run virtual enterprise network in a typical region or sector should deliver an excess of 2 million in new revenue and 25 plus potential jobs created or protected over a five year period. Those are pretty good numbers for anybody. If, if you want to create an these can be companies or they can be knowledge workers. One of the things you have to discover quickly is their synergy. So that's the first foundation. You need critical mass of core member companies. My experience is you haven't got 10 people in your network through no, no shows and all the other stuff. It's just going to die. A good network typically needs about 30, 30 people in it. But if you have three really committed people, they can start a network. You need the right kind of companies in the network. Um, you need the right industry. You don't want an industry that's absolutely dead. You want one with an opportunity or maybe a threat hanging over. You need the right individuals. You want the leaders. You don't want the middle management who would be freed up to go to meetings. And you need the right companies. They must be hungry and ambitious. Their, their ambition must, mustn't be saved from where they've got to already. The network must include innovation partners, particularly the universities. No, not the really blue sky guys. Uh, the people who are into applied research and, and are really interested in delivering solutions to the customer. And then must have a link in the source of innovation. They can get started without it, but it can survive. But you don't let the academics set the program for the event. It's got to be market-led. The secret of the event is starting by selling what you have. And this gives you a long way to create something new. I'd like to tell you you can build networks uh, in, in, in a couple of months. My experience is I've never built any network in under 12 months. But after six months, I knew whether it was a network or not. <coughs> uh, so in that period, you need support from government. You need them to pay for meeting rooms. You need them to maybe buy some facilitation time. If, if companies could have got networks running by themselves, do, do you not think they would have done it by now? Uh, we might drive about the regional development agencies and the enterprise bodies, but we can't start networks without their help. So the idea is you give it 6 to 12 months. If it's not working and they're not starting to win business, after 12 months, shut them down. They're not a network. You know. I have a, an incubation process for building networks. First stage is selection. Uh, you identify companies and people. Incubation, and people start to explore. Mobilization, you get your act together to the minimum level before you approach anybody to try and sell them anything. Next stage is market testing, where you're established and it's <coughs> your identity. Then there's viability, you've got your first business success, a long way from complete yet. 
then differentiation, then sustainability. So it's it, it's a process you need to go through. You can't build a network in a couple of months. Although you can find out within maybe a month whether if you haven't got a network, you can prove a network false very very quickly. The network's always looking for suitable new members and associates. You need to grow and scale. A then it is a, an open arrangement. It's not a supply chain. Um, you need to constantly attract people. And one of the problems is when a network's working well, the existing members don't want anybody else to join. A network then needs a form of governance model and a great set of rough ground rules. And we worked a bit on that this afternoon as well. And it's basically uh, what would destroy trust? How are you going to make your decisions? How are you going to share information? What's the rules about new members? What's the rules about intellectual property and what are the sanctions? You start with ground rules and when you've created something and you've something to argue about, then you get the legal people in. So what I do with groups is I have 10 questions I ask them uh, to establish the ground rules and I get them to answer individually and I aggregate their answers. And you know what? 90% of us all agree. And then I use a second meeting just to sort out the bits we didn't agree on. What damages trust? Typically freeloading damages trust, people not putting their weight. What destroys trust? People misusing your secrets, giving you wrong information, stealing your ideas. What are the conflicts of interest? How will we share information? What's going to be transparent? What's going to be private? Two pages. If it's more than two pages, people aren't going to follow. Collective capabilities database. Each company explicitly states its capabilities. That's one of the rules of the network. You have to say what you're good at and what you can't do. Um, and with networks, network strategy has to be capability led. You have to build on what you have. You're not like a monolithic company who can decide we're going to go into this market. You don't know what you and you don't actually know what you have when you start the network. So one of the tricks is creating what I call a heat map. And this is basically showing where the network's strong. I call that the top left the hot zone. And it's saying, for example, there's five companies there who work in the area of customizing business solutions and consultants. This is an IT network. That's the hot zone. That's where the network's going to win work. What's the bad news? There's five companies going to argue about who's going to do it. Um, so that's where you focus your initial work you, in business and develop. The warm zone is where you're nearly able to win work but you, and you can extend your capabilities. The cool zone is where forget it. Uh, so, so you don't start networks to go off to win work in places you can't win work as, as individual companies. Some people don't realize that. Cool zone, the only way to get into that is through partnerships and new members. And finally, the ice zone, you know, don't, don't even go there, it's not worth it. So this is a very good technique. It's just done in a simple Excel spreadsheet. You sort vertically and you sort horizontally, and all the red stuff automatically goes up to the top. Now you have to believe what the members tell you, but uh, on the so self-assessment of capabilities. So heat map is one of the most powerful strategic tools I've ever seen. A network needs single identity and um, purpose. You need a good identity as well. I went to see an organization called the Virtual Fabric. And they all had, they were all different companies, but they all had virtual fabric waistcoats. They were Swiss, so, so they were a bit unusual to start with. Hmm. Uh, and, and they had business cards. Here's a good test for your network. If people have to put their own business cards out, maybe you're not a network. You need common processes, practices, and standards uh, for how you conduct yourself in meetings. Most people can't do a successful conference call. Uh, how do you resolve issues? How do you develop bids? Most small businesses are incompetent at developing the kind of bids needed to sell to big businesses. So I recommend a network invest in a professional bid manager. And also small businesses get what I call bid fright. You put opportunities in front of saying, oh, we're too busy, we're too busy. And the reality is, they don't win the first three bids. They're learning experiences, so you have to get them to bid and they, they fail forward. Then you need a strong leadership and roles team. Command and control is one leader. And from all my work in biology, I've discovered self-managed teams, everybody's a leader. It's not nobody's a leader, but everybody's a leader. And networks have many leaders, each doing different things. That's the key point. This is what I've developed over a number of years. These are the rules you need in a network. 
it starts A, B, C, D, E, G. I'm Irish, and I left out the F, okay? Yeah. Sue me. Uh, uh, start, and you start with B, the broker. The broker brings work to the network, but he brings all sorts of things you wouldn't touch with a barge pole. The architect then knows what the network can do, and him and the broker agree it's worth going after. Then somebody like me coaches them in putting in a collaborative bid. Then you need some technology support, that's for the D. You need an executive leader for a network. Generally, this is somebody the network trusts, and you know what? They don't trust each other. So often the executive leader has to be in neutral. Um, and then you need group leaders. In a big meeting like this, you can't get a lot done. If you want to get a lot done, you go to small groups. Finally, you need some technology. And you really need three things, which are very, very simple. You need some sort of public web portal to manage its interaction with potential customers and new members. You need to look like you're a unity. You need your own private member collaboration system, you know, a virtual workspace. And you do need some distinctive applications inside the, this workspace, such as the ability to aggregate capabilities. So that's it. There's all the snooker balls in one go. And I hope this helps you pot a few winners. Thank you very much. Confused by this concept of virtual enterprise networks, I went back to the skiff, which by now had moved into a larger space, and worked with other local Drupal people on projects, including one for the Cartoon Network and one for Disney. The good times were here, and I found an amazing flat and could finally afford to go to my first DrupalCon, which was Copenhagen back in 2010. I still didn't fully understand this community thing, but armed with my virtual enterprise network book and some new business cards, I decided to put my name down for a session on the Boff Day, which they had. Unfortunately, I decided to call it Drushi, as in Drupal and Sushi, but everyone thought I was going to do a talk on Drush, so that didn't work out too well. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun though, and we even had our own Drupal beer, awesome sauce. And as it happens, Jeremy Keith was presenting the keynote there, which was strange, he lived in Brighton, so I knew him, but he doesn't do Drupal. On sprint day, I really didn't know what was going on. I saw these people working on stuff, so I tried to help out on the upgrade path, but failed at the first hurdle trying to put my books for site through it with all those modules. Didn't work very well. I also experienced my first encounter with the Drupal Association here when I bumped into one of the directors and asked them if they knew about virtual enterprise networks, as I had this book which had this model which worked just like we do in the Drupal community. I must have sounded a bit badly, as I received a rather shrug response. And I went asked if there was anyone I could speak to at the DA about it. I was told they were all too busy working for large corporations. <laughs> I thought. Soon enough, I was back in Brighton, though, enjoying my love of cars. And not long after, I went into Jeremy Keith again. This time he was doing a talk at Bar Camp Brighton, which I later saw him take away at Royal. So this is how it works, I thought. It wasn't long before I was off again, this time to the Drupal CXO event in Brussels. I tried to do Ken's synergy discovery technique. A few people got it, but not many. Oh well, try again next year, I thought. I went to the Drupal developer days, where we talked about Drupy dollars and app stores, and more Drupal beer, of course. Then I thought, well, America's the place where the business is, so I went to DrupalCon Chicago, which was amazing, because it was all in one hotel, with sessions on one level, boff on another, etc. I mostly went to boffs, and this is where I first started the video sessions and upload them to archive.org. It was only a small amount of people that could physically get to DrupalCons, and boffs seemed to be where the real stuff happened, so I was keen to record as much as I could. Chicago was cool, it really blew your head off. But it wasn't long, and I was back in Brighton. More beach, more cars. I was running the local Drupal user groups, and also visited an under one every so often. And then, it was the big day. DrupalCon London was here. <laughs> By this time, I bought a decent video camera to record sessions and involved myself in a few of the boffs on education, councils, and federated social web. Not long after, I organised our first big event in Brighton, a Drupal Discovery Day, as part of our Brighton Digital Festival. It went really great, and we trained people in the morning along with having a business afternoon. Not long after that, I went up to Manchester to do some Drupal training. Back in Brighton, it was time to get kitted out with some new gear and hit the road again, this time to Drupal Science Camp in Cambridge, my first Drupal camp and my first session. I was determined to pursue the virtual enterprise network model, so I planned on going to as many events around Europe as I could to talk to the community members and see what they thought. The first CXO event of 2012 I went to was in Amsterdam in a Microsoft building. We 
we had the same conversations on marketing as we had at previous CX events, and I wondered why nothing had really moved along much. It seemed we had a wonderful modular piece of software, and we just needed to build the modular business model on top. But when it came to the business side, everyone was reinventing the wheel. I bumped into another DA board member, Visa Palmu, and I knew there was community elections, so I asked him how they were going. He said there'd only been a couple of people apply, and I thought, wow, really? No one cares enough? And decided to nominate myself, as this was the last day for entries. A friend of mine made a little funny graphic, and within a week I found myself voted in as the first community elected director of the Drupal Association. The next event I went to was CXO Products in Rome, which is when I decided to start bringing my little friend from DrupalCon London along, DrupalCon. The fun didn't really start though until my first official event as director, which was DrupalCon Denver. I even had the first class treatment as Visa had a spare pass for his first class lounge at Heathrow, which was nice. I decided to just pay for my own travel and accommodation. I didn't want to take the money from the association, but looking back now, I realise I should have, especially as taking the time out meant I had big issues with a project I was working on back in the UK, which I ended up losing. Still, Denver was exciting, but we discussed the search for a new executive director and organised where the next Drupal comes would be. I didn't get to talk about the virtual enterprise network much, though. As I couldn't afford to stay longer than the meeting, I ended up travelling two days to be there, just for two days, just to travel back again for two days, but I did get to go for a drive and see some wonderful waterfalls, which was nice. Back in Brighton, we started our Drupal ladder meetups, and again I worked with local Drupal shops to deliver training to a large e-learning company, but still I was trying to figure out what this community thing was, and how we could leverage each other without having to work in the supply chain, or grow our own big company. Vends were surely the way forward, but not easy to get up and running, especially without any form of funding. Next up was DrupalCon Munich. By that time, we'd managed to get an official Drupal branding and marketing committee set up at the Drupal Association with Ben Finkley heading up. And at the Munich Sprint, we took over the marketing of Drupal Group on groups.drupal.org. The interface isn't great for non-techies though, and although we had some initial great but heated marketing discussion, use of this group has unfortunately died down. Back in Brighton, and it was back to work again. This time for our second Drupal camp of the year, moved to fit in with the Brighton Digital Festival. I thought I'd lost my DrupalCon asset, so created a montage for all my travels. I then found them safe and well, but not before I was sent a load of new ones by the lovely Ixis IT. With the marketing group up and running and doing stuff, it wasn't long before the next community elections were up. I nominated myself again, though I wasn't sure who, if anyone, was going to nominate themselves. Luckily, loads of people applied, and after listening to all the hustings, I was happy in the knowledge that many passionate people had applied, so I decided to withdraw my candidacy so I could focus on the virtual enterprise network. My last board meeting was a bad camp in San Francisco, which I was mega excited to be able to attend. We welcomed all new board members and worked on the goals for 2013, which was nice, as I've not had a chance to work on the ones for 2012. The DA experience was great, and it's vitally important that we have someone looking after our architecture and organising the big events, but I still think we have a long way to go before the DA can fulfil its mission of supporting the entire community. As a small, resource-limited organisation, also limited under the terms of the educational non-profit, the DA can only do so much, and it will take time for that to grow. Mostly it is DrupalCons and Drupal.org, the latter of which needs much more investment in it. I can believe we can support the DA by creating member-owned organisations which the community build in a bottom-up as opposed to top-down way, and that's where the Virtual Enterprise Network comes in. So, it was back to a wintry Brighton where I had the thought that the cooperative model would work well for the vet and Drop Co-op was born. There's a big movement for co-ops in Brighton at the moment, which is great for moral support. In the new year, my mother unfortunately had a stroke, so I went to look after her for a while, but now I'm back in Brighton, it's time to get this thing up and running, hence why I'm here catching you up on it. Thank you for listening, please do visit drop.coop and start joining in. see why I didn't talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Lunch time. One o'clock on the dot. Yeah? One o'clock on the dot. Uh, should be good. Yeah, it's ten to the night. Thank you.